Hey everybody, it's Mike. I'm the chairman of the board of the Food Addiction Institute, and we have with us today Cynthia Myers Morrison, an amazing woman. This, the story is going to blow your mind. I interviewed her one time a while back, and it's just an amazing story. Board member at the at the institute, and she's literally uh, ground zero. Interview number one for the series that we are creating, which is um, food addicts uh, telling their story out loud in public so as to A, get some health care, more health care, and more opportunities for food addiction uh, and, and, and food addiction as a substance use disorder, not an eating disorder. And, um, and then just so that people, like the, the, the anonymity, there's a big movement in the world of substance use disorders called the New Recovery Advocacy Movement, uh, big giant nonprofits doing it. And we are uh, lagging way behind as a group in the uh, getting this information out to food addicts and people that are struggling uh, with this addiction. So Cynthia, I am so happy to have you. We had such fun on our last interview. Uh, we have developed her, uh, Cynthia and I have developed, uh, just before we went on the air, by the way, uh, a little format that you've probably seen before. It's uh, a few minutes of what happened or what it was like, and then a few minutes of what happened and a few minutes of what it's like now. And then Cynthia and I will continue to talk after that. And we'll have some questions and some back and forth. And her, you guys got to look forward to this because her, her and I have some spirited and fun conversations. So anyway, without uh, me rambling on anymore, Cynthia, how are you? And thank you for doing this. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for doing this. And thank you for being our chairperson for Food Addiction Institute. I'm delighted to be ground zero. That's wonderful. Right. An honor and a privilege. So what... It used to be like was that um, from a very young age, like five years old, I lied, cheat, and stole regarding food. And that was, that was it. And I did that with other substances and behaviors as well. Uh, food was not the only one, but it certainly was the one that started earliest and lasted longest, and with which I suffered the most, and quietly and internally and out loud. So um, without knowing that it was food that was the problem, I didn't know. And so we don't know what we don't know until we do know. And what happened for me was that uh, at one point, I knew that I was struggling with the food. I had a solution. They gave me a, you know, a plan of eating that seemed to work, but I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. It seemed like too much effort. Like, well, I wasn't that bad. All of the denial systems that so many people sometimes go through, and I did for another 27 years after that. So I had the solution, and for 27 years more, I struggled. So I struggled for the first 24 years of my life. Then I struggled for another 27 years of my life. This is not a good story. This is not a good story. I got lots of um, psychological labels during that time because people don't know that food addiction looks like a lot of um, labels that are colorful and they tell you, you know, this is who you are, this is what you are, these are the things that will make you better. But they didn't say to me, abstinence will make you better. So I had to, to find that solution before I knew that I had other questions and that the label was food addiction. I didn't know. So I struggled with the food. I fought with the food. I ate excessive amounts. I binged. I, I tried purging once and got two very large black eyes. I decided that was one thing I was not going to do again. Um, maybe that was not supposed to be for my behavior. And then I tried you know, I tried alternate fasting for parts of the day, for all of the day, for, you know, multiple days. And I would fall into the food again, literally dive into it. And I had favorite things that I just loved. They were gooey and cold and smooth and, you know, the comfort foods. Comfort foods were my favorite. I come from a um, family that's part, part Welsh and part uh, Latinate history. And we put noodles, homemade egg noodles, on top of mashed potatoes. Now, 
that might be necessary for people who are working in the fields. That is necessary for someone, you know, doing the lifestyle that I have had. But that was one of my favorite foods. So that gives you an idea, you know, some of it. Um, I also love sweets. And I would convince myself that if I bought one of them and ate one dessert in the restaurant and then bought two more to take outside and eat in the car on the way to wherever I was going next, that those other two didn't count. They didn't count. And I was like, what kind of thinking is this? I think of myself as intelligent. I have some, some degrees and all of that, but I was with food was not that. So I got to the point that I wanted to kill myself. And I had eaten frozen dairy product one night. The next morning I woke up and I thought, I cannot go on living this way. And the other things that were going on in my, my life were fine. I had a great job. I had acquired the position that I'd always longed to have. I had a new car. I had a condo in Los Angeles, not far from the beach. I mean, what is wrong with this life? But for me, the feeling of I have to kill myself because I cannot tolerate living with this, this head, this body. And on that day, um, someone gave me an alternative. And that alternative um, was a food plan that I had seen 27 years before. And I didn't want to do it then. And that day I was willing to do one meal, just one. Not more, but just one. And I spent a lot of days doing one meal and one meal, but I would do three of them in the same day. So um, that was a huge change because I had been one of those that had had one meal where I grazed through the whole day and, you know, some days and then other days where I would starve through most of the day and then graze for the evening hours, et cetera. And I spent so many times just falling asleep and foggy brain and aching muscles, joints that just plagued my body and my life. And I was 224 pounds at one point. And I, I am not that size now. I'm down 90, close to 90 pounds down mm -hmm. from and have been, have been at this size for almost 21 years. Mm -hmm. I stopped mm -hmm. eating grains and sugar. And when I stopped eating grains and sugar, the mental obsession left, the physical cravings left. I did go through some withdrawal. Emotionally, I was a wreck for a while. Um, but it passed. It passed. And I was able to deal with tenacity with other issues that had plagued me, too. I mean, migraines had been a part of my life. Uh, dysmenorrhea had been part of my life. There had been all sorts of different physiological disorders that I had had, as well as emotional ones. And mm -hmm. as of being grain and sugar free, many of those dissipated and some of them went away entirely. And the others I was able to stay with the solution oriented process to get to a solution. Sometimes it took a while, but I would to do that. And I'd never been able to do that when I was in the food. So abstinence changed my life changed my life. All those years of trying to moderate had not changed my life. They had been miserable, uncomfortable, physically, mentally, spiritually, everything. And from grain and sugar changed my life. So I had known that for a long time about alcohol, but I had not been willing to make that transfer of information that moderation didn't work with alcohol. Why did I think it was going to work with the substances that make alcohol? And they made those substances in my body. There were times that people looked at me and said, Cindy, you look like you're drunk. And I was. I was drunk on the substances that make alcohol, not on the alcohol because I had quit, but substances that make alcohol. So, so that was what happened. And what my life has been for this last 21 years is – living life on life's terms. I've had life issues. Um, I got married in, in this 21 years. My husband and I have been married 20 years now almost. And having had, um, this is my third husband. So having had some experiences before and a wife of 14 years in there too, I 
I had a number of experiences, a lot of relationships, uh, the varying degrees and length. But this one I've been able to stay in, to delight in, to live in. And that's a huge change that I attribute to being grain and sugar free. Um, I recently, I'm 72 years old, and I recently had a hip replacement, a total hip replacement. And after three weeks, the doctor saw me and he said, you can do whatever you want to do. Jazzercise, sure, go, go for it. Just don't fall down. And I am now five weeks out from the surgery and I have a four inch scar and I had very little inflammation because I don't eat grain and sugar. So I had almost no pain. I had very little need for uh, drugs or anything. I mean, Tylenol was about it. And after the surgery, they did let me go to sleep during the surgery. I didn't. <laughs> um, although I know people who have, I'm not one of them. Um, but that's part of it. I ski today. I'm, as I said, 72 years old. I love to ski. And in the winter, I go skiing. And I do jazzercise frequently. I walk a, a good deal. I'm active in service, in support groups, as well as in Food Addiction Institute. And I look forward to a life that is just filled with delight and with life's issues. I mean, I have, I have things go on in my life. My mother has dementia. Um, I love doing genealogy, and I regret that she didn't. She and I didn't do more earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have in our family the history of alcoholism and drug addiction and food addiction and, 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 and I'm in the generation where I have a solution for, for all of these things that have plagued my family members in the past. So I'm grateful for that. And my desire is to pass that on to others. And that's why I'm doing this. Sometimes we can't pass it on to our family members as readily as we would like. <laughs> it on to somebody else who can pass it on to somebody else who may circle around to pass it on to a family member that we love. So, so that's where I am today. And I, I'm recovering out loud, out loud, because this is life. And I get to live it grain and alcohol and sugar free, which has given me a life way beyond my wildest dreams. Thanks, Mike. Oh, that was amazing. I, that was just really amazing. <laughs> really, thanks. Uh, and by the way, you look amazing for 72 years old. I just can't <laughs> even fathom, really. It's just amazing. I, I, I hope I can only aspire to look that good. Um, I'm going to play with this gallery view because I mean, you and I are going to have a little talk now. Yep. There we go. Um, so speaker view. Okay, well, I'm just going to remember what it is. Um, so anyway, um, I got a bunch of questions, but I'm going to start with a lot of our folks who will view these videos are, are, and then listen to these on their podcasts or what on their audios are kind of new to this, right? Obviously, they're, they're brand new to this, some of them. And we're inter you are introducing a concept or a construct that um, most people are afraid of, A, I'm sure, and to think is way extreme, which is abstinence from all sugars and flours. And you put grains, and I agree with that. And I came to that late in the party. I was sugar and flour free for many, many years before I actually quit grains. Um, so can you just kind of tell folks, to, you know, I think the question they always want to know is, is it even possible? And how is it even possible? How do they, like in today's society, with that sugar in everything and flour and everything and the diets that we've all been raised on, how the heck can people do it? And, and how did you do it? Thank you for that question. I, um, as you heard me say, for 27 years, I thought, no, this is impossible. I couldn't possibly do it, even though I had for a short period of time in 1971. And in 1998, I started again with this, this plan of not eating grain and sugar. Um, how to do that? Practical things get those substances out of the house. First of all, 
I'm one of those who believes that sugar is something that none of us should eat. None of us. Because it's, it is a problem. And if you read Gary Tobe's book, The Case Against Sugar, I don't think anyone would put it in their mouths after that or give it to anyone they loved. Certainly not anyone they loved. And Robert Lustig's work has certainly said that. And Nicole Levine's work. So there are scientists and, and science writers that are saying that to us now, that weren't saying that to us in the 70s necessarily. Although there were a few people, um, the Sugar Blues and people of that ilk that were talking about it even then, but yeah. they were way crazy people, you know, so but <laughs> I don't think so. Um, how to do it. I shop in regular markets at regular grocery stores. I shop usually around the outside edge. So I go to the fruits and vegetables and I don't take the starchy ones. I go on around to the fish chicken, proteins of all sorts, um, I eat soy, you know, and I buy soy nuts and do things with soy also. I go on around to the, um, skip over, there's one part there that has products in it I don't eat, and I skip on over, I make little dashes into the aisles sometimes for canned goods that are inexpensive or for frozen vegetables that are inexpensive, and I buy them on sale you know, if there are 10, 10 green packages for $10, I buy them and put them in the freezer. I often have uh, fruit food in my freezer that I've cooked in a crock pot. And that is so simple. I put the proteins in there. I put, them in, I put several proteins in, in the crock pot together and cook them at the same time overnight. And the next morning, I have things for breakfast that lots of people eat for dinner. But I'll have salmon, fresh salmon from a broil, a broiler, uh, and pineapple for breakfast. I will also have uh, pork pot roast and some berries for breakfast. I do all sorts of things as well as smoothies made with kefir milk and, um, and yogurt and frozen fruit for the breakfast. And I eat vegetables and protein and oil at lunch and dinner. And the, it's easy, and I make I make things that um, you know that I, are transportable. So I take things with me. I carry food with me so that in my car. So if I am at a restaurant and I don't have exactly what I need, the car is usually close, and I can get to it. I um, keep track of my food at the very beginning. I kept track of the food very closely, what the quantities were, and what the response was of my body. So if I had a foggy head two hours after I had eaten, or if I had hunger in my belly two hours after I had eaten, I made a notation of that because something that I had eaten two hours before was not working for me. And it might have been something that would work for other people, but not for me. And I needed to take note of that and be aware. Eating in restaurants, I have to ask for what I want and self-care. Oh my gosh, I've learned how to be self-caring. I take care of me and this other person is not responsible. I have to be very specific, ask specifically for what I want. And if it comes and it's not what I asked for, I repeat it and say, thank you so much, but I need it to be exactly what I ask for. Thank you so much. And I tip well. So I'll get it that when I come back to their restaurant, they want to do what I've asked them to do. So it's very, very precise and tangible. Um, my husband, when he was asked how was he going to tolerate being in restaurants with me, he said, well, I asked her to marry me while she was weighing and measuring her food to make sure she got enough food. And my girlfriend went, what? <laughs> so she got it real quickly that I take care of myself and he loving me wants to support me in that. When people are not doing that, I say in my head and sometimes out loud, if they keep pressing me, how does my taking care of me harm you? Oh, I like that. Care of me harm you. Because really, it's not their business what I'm putting in my body. <laughs> so there we have it. 
I like it. I like it. I was just going to go into the social part, but you did cover a little bit. But, you know, people, they're, they're so offended sometimes that you're not eating what they're eating or what they want you to eat. So it's crazy out there. Family members are the hardest, though, because we grow up wanting to please parents and siblings, family members, especially. And when they make something special for us that we've always loved and they, they're they not going to eat it, it's yeah. very sad for them. And yeah. so I try to get the message out that I'm not eating the way that I used to. This is what I do eat. And people have come around over the years right. <laughs> to accept right. that I eat the way I eat. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it, it really is amazing out there. I'm just trying to... <clears throat> You're a deep thinker, and I like that. Um, how do you think all the? I mean, given what where we are today in the, you know, the 80 plus percent of stuff and, and the obesity rate skyrocketing since high fructose corn syrup came into the, the diet and people. I mean, you've worked with as many people as I have, and the and the people trying to get off this stuff and the the pain out there. It's so obvious to folks like you and I who are on the other side of the fence who see people who are just too tired that to, to put up a social front anymore and they just say they know that the sugar and the flour is really what's you know their their addiction. How do you see all this playing out? Because it's it seems like such a monumental task. And I mean you know, I know it's a big question, but how do you how do you feel about that? Well, as our children get to be more and more obese percentage-wise in our society, and as our international world becomes more obese, right. um, we, we begin to recognize that we're killing our young people. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a Stephen Vincent Benet poem about World War I, and that the bombing had killed off the last of the generation, and except for this one person, just one person. And the parents were explaining to him that he was the last child born. We don't want to be in that situation. Mm. We don't want to do that to our children. And feeding them the things that we're feeding them and allowing them to drink the sugar sweet beverages that we're allowing will not serve them any at all. Mm. And Robert Lustig's work has certainly proven that, uh, the work with, with uh, diabetic children and children who have fatty liver disease. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as children, this mm -hmm. is not acceptable in our society. So maybe we ourselves may look at our situations and say, you know, I don't care, me, I can't stop. But we need to start looking at our children and realize that they are the ones going to continue to suffer in ways that we can't even imagine yet. The number of heart disease uh, situations with liver disease, with diabetes, the mm -hmm. list goes on and on. So, so how do we make the change? One person at a time. Right. One person at a time. Right. And I can't change another person, but I can change me. And I can talk with other people about the changes that I've made. And first, sugar is is one that people will say, yes, I need to get off sugar. Okay, try it. And if you cannot abstain from sugar, probably the next thing is grains. So try, try no sugar. If you are still having problems staying off of sugar, try no flour. If you, if you still can't stay off of sugar and flour, try no grains at all and no sugar. Because go that step, step further to abstinence, to, to get the freedom that is yours and rightfully yours. As soon as you have no cravings, no physiological craving, you will want to continue to do this because that freedom is an amazing freedom. Mm -hmm. so. That was great. I mean, you, it was so well said about the children and it's always been my concern. I, I really, um, that's just, just amazing and so true and per, a perfect one of the things I find is uh, parents will do something for their child that they would not even do for themselves and if we can they if they start to realize that 
Um, if they, children at a very young age, they, no matter what you tell them, they just want to do what you do. They, they want to be like you. And so if you're, so that's going to almost force the parents to get on the, get on the plan or get in the game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. So what else would you like to tell the folks? We're going to um, wrap up here, but I, I want to, you know, uh, get whatever thoughts that you have about your abstinence, your um, evolution through this, where we are in society personally, or um, your friends, whatever. Just uh, what would you like to, what message do you, would you like to tell the world about uh, this kind of very controversial subject? And really, I, I think of us as pioneers a little bit. We're early in the game. I think it's kind of hard to believe that we're early in the game, but we are pretty early, early in the game. I think of educating people on this uh, subject of topic of, and I think at the core of it is the abstinence, this idea that moderation is not going to work for some people. Now it may for some others, but for some people who have identified as they cannot stop, like, they, like they've tried a hundred times cannot stop type folks, um, that maybe abstinence is the answer. So what are your thoughts on all that? Well, the abstinence certainly is the core. That's the very central core message that moderation for an addict does not work. And if you can't stop eating the things that you're trying to stop, you can't stop eating your trigger foods, you may be an addict. It may be necessary to say, I am an addict in the same way that I might be a heroin addict, a cocaine addict, a drug addict of other sorts, alcohol, at any of the substance or, or behaviors too. Um, I have some others, some others as you may have gathered. As we all do, as we all do. <laughs> yes. so, so the bottom line is that uh, abstinence from triggers is the solution, even though it doesn't seem like it. And one day at a time or one meal at a time that I eat more food today than I ever did when I was trying to starve and binge. I would mm -hmm. binge large quantities, but then when you took it out over a period of time, I was starving a lot too because I was trying not to binge. I was trying not to overeat. I was trying to contain my weight in some way or another. And you were eating low density, uh, mm -hmm. low, low nutrient density food. That's food. right. That's right. And eating the kinds of foods that I eat today, fruits, vegetables, proteins, and oils, they are delicious and wonderful and flavorful. Mm. So that's one thing. My sister um, died of, of this, and she died at 368 pounds. And when she was 100 pounds overweight, I thought I could never be like that. I have so much more self-control than that. Until the day came when I weighed 100 pounds more than I should have been weighing that mm. was my optimal weight. And so I, at her death, I knew that I could be 368 pounds too. If I continued to eat the way that I did, do the things that I did. And I don't wish that death on anyone. I know people that have been 500 pounds and are now, one fellow that I know is now 185 pounds. Mm. That, an amazing change and the change from having diabetes from having kidney disease to not having diabetes and not having kidney disease that is miraculous but that's what the change that's what happened and it's this abstinence-based program so it is possible to do it one day at a time one meal at a time and cleaning out the house the food addiction institute has a wonderful starter starter uh, brochure on how to get ready, how to, how to start making these changes in your life. And it's not easy at the beginning because through withdrawals, but we can go through the withdrawals and come out on the other side. Very good. Thank you so much. And, and yeah, folks, if, you, uh, if you're hearing this on a podcast or on uh, YouTube or a channel not on the site, uh, you can go to foodaddictioninstitute.org and there's a 40-page booklet on the starter booklet. If this is something of interest to you, make sure you grab that booklet. It's an awesome uh, teaching tool and it'll get you in the system that uh, you can find some other people that are doing this. So 
Cindy, again, thank you so much. This has been an amazing time, and I really, really appreciate you doing this. And uh, hopefully, in the future, we can uh, collaborate again. I think you and I will. I think you and I need to have a longer and deeper discussion about this. But uh, for now, let's get this, let's get this train rolling. Let's get some more folks. Another thing, on a quick plug, if you are a recovering food addict of any stripe, uh, a recovering food addict who has chosen abstinence over flour and sugar and other grain and other substances like that, and you would like to be interviewed for our uh, little series here, uh, there should be a link here somewhere or just uh, go to the foodaddictioninstitute.org and you'll see a place where you can uh, fill out a little form and we'll interview you and we can tell your story. We'd love that. So anyway, folks, uh, we'll see you on the next one. We will look for these pretty, re pretty regularly. We're going to have uh, hopefully a lot of new folks. Cynthia is going to bring us a few. A lot of new folks on the um, – um, I'm trying to find the recording thing. I don't want to uh, – uh, a lot of new folks on the uh, the series, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye bye.